When you come to church, you probably normally expect to hear one sermon. But today is a little different. Yes, there is the sermon that you're listening to or not right now, but we've already heard little bits of other sermons, much more ancient than this one, in our Scripture readings. Our Gospel reading gave us some verses from Christ's Sermon on the Mount. It is at least arguable that Paul's letters were kinds of sermons albeit ones delivered at a distance, because it's generally thought that his letters would have been read aloud to the congregations to whom they were addressed. And the book of Deuteronomy from the Old Testament is presented as if it were a sermon delivered by Moses in the desert east of the River Jordan, at the point at which the children of Israel were to enter the promised land. Now, if I were to try to deliver a sermon like Moses, I doubt if any of us would last the course. It runs to 34 chapters, and it's packed with teaching. But naturally, this isn't a sermon in the modern sense. It blends teaching with story, with commentary. Nobody would seriously suggest that Moses did actually stand up one day and preach what we know as the book of Deuteronomy, still less that some scribe wrote down his words, word for word. Rather, this book is a collection of different materials, which is given an overarching structure through being presented as the voice of Moses. But I don't think this makes it any less a kind of sermon. A sermon is not simply a text delivered by a preacher in the course of a service of worship. It can, as we have already noted with Paul's letters, take a variety of forms. These days, the church is being challenged to explore different kinds of sermons. In all probability, Jesus' sermons would have been more interactive than we're used to here. You can imagine people answering him back asking questions, engaging in some kind of conversation with him. Perhaps we should be exploring that idea. New technology is offering possibilities to deliver sermons in different ways, not just through the written word like Paul did, but to broadcast sermons well beyond church buildings and beyond set times. I think this raises challenges to how we understand what sermons are and indeed what worship is. What does it mean, for example, to gather in worship when people are physically remote but connected through technology? Is it still worship if you're accessing a recording of something that happened some time ago? I think these are important questions as we explore new opportunities to communicate the gospel in new ways. And the Church of Scotland is quite consciously and deliberately doing that. You may have seen recently that Albert Bogle, who was moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, about uh, three or four years ago, and has recently retired as minister of a church in Bowness, has been appointed a pioneer ministry to develop online worship and online congregation. So he's wrestling with questions such as these as part of his role now. 
and I suspect the whole church will benefit in way, some ways from his work. There are several features and characteristics which distinguish sermons from other forms of discourse. And I think that they are to be found in the text from Deuteronomy, which Doreen read for us. First and most importantly, sermons should be sacramental. They should not just be about something in the way that a nature program on the television might be about polar bears. Watching a program like that, we are probably grateful that someone else has endured the cold, the discomfort, and the danger to show us the polar bears. And if, if we think about it, we're probably quite glad that the bears are not present with us. But a sermon should seek to make its subject real for those who hear. It's hard to explain, but it has something to do with taking the step from passive reception to involvement. A sermon does not just propose a hypothesis which the hearers can take or leave. A sermon should bring God to the people and the people to God. Or at least that's what I think every preacher should aim for. And it should make past events, what we read about in the Bible, a present reality. Moses' sermon in Deuteronomy does just that, making present to the people waiting to cross the Jordan the events of the Exodus and the giving of the law. It's saying, these are the things that have made you the people you are, which have brought you thus far, which will continue to shape you in your new life in the promised land. And to subsequent readers of this text, it is making present the act of crossing the Jordan and coming into the promised land, an act laden with theological significance. Second, sermons are exhortations delivered within communities of the faithful. A whole host of material can make up the subject of a sermon. The purpose of Moses' sermon is to bring the people to repentance and reform, reminding them of their origins, reminding them of God's blessing, reminding them of the law which God had given them. In the view of Deuteronomy, the people of Israel, the hearers, are God's own people because of God's choice and actions not because of their own. Through its words, the people are called to live in a manner appropriate for those whom God has chosen. And it warns these people not to defy God. The part that we have read together this morning comes from near the end of the book, and it is the point at which Deuteronomy reaches its dramatic climax. The history of Israel thus far has been rehearsed. The Ten Commandments have been proclaimed. The law has been explained. And now, for the people listening, comes the point of response. The point for decision, the point for making a choice. Moses puts that choice before them. Will you follow 
God's law, or will you not? After all the stuff that has come before it, this is a stunningly simple choice. No one on reaching this point, having listened to all that's gone before, having read all that's gone before, could be in any doubt as to what God requires, what God's values are, what God offers His people. Moses puts it very plainly. He says, see, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. That's the choice that is faced. We are given these choices and others that go with them. The first is the choice of whether you believe the whole premise that there is a God who offers blessing in whose gift there is life and prosperity, but without whom there is nothing but death and destruction. You could walk away saying, it's all made up, and many have done just that. But for those who don't, those who don't walk away, those who do accept that there is a God, there comes another choice, life and prosperity or death and destruction. Now, to be clear, in this context, prosperity is not about wealth. The choice is not about an offer of riches. It's about well-being, accepting what God provides, not just in material terms, but more importantly, in terms of the love and care He provides through those He gives to love us and to care for us. By any sober assessment, God here is not offering a choice between equal possibilities. Who, knowing that there is a way to life and well-being, would choose the way to death and destruction? Yet the bizarre thing is that that is what people do all the time. Deuteronomy was written at a time in the history of Israel when the people had turned their backs on obedience to God and were chasing after idols and false gods. The immediate historical context was the experience of exile not in Egypt, but in Babylon. Those who wrote the book were looking back into Israel's history and drawing parallels between these two great experiences of oppression, of enslavement, of escape, and of return to the place of promise. Deuteronomy, you see, simply means second law, not because the book contains new laws, but because it's presented in the Bible for the second time. When it was written, it was representing the law to a people who had largely abandoned and forgotten it. All too often, we behave like those who have forgotten what God desires for us. Our New Testament readings give examples Paul speaks of jealousy and quarreling among the people of God. He addresses divisions within the church based on false loyalties. Some people were claiming loyalty to Paul and others to Apollos. But Paul hates this, and he exhorts the members of the church in Corinth to work together, giving their loyalty not to any teacher but to Christ alone, not to follow a servant, but to follow the Master. And in the Gospel reading, 
Jesus speaks of relationships which have soured, getting in the way of discipleship. The souring of a relationship to the extent that it ends in murder is so obviously wrong that it cannot be accommodated or endured. But Jesus says we put up with all sorts of soured relationships which divert us from our path to God. Our angers, our jealousies, the things we do wrong to each other, all these affect our ability to serve God. They sap our energies. They distract us and ultimately lead us away from our Creator. And so, Jesus says, if you're in that kind of situation, do something about it. He doesn't say what in detail, because He knows that no situation is beyond our ability to address. It's all a matter of the choices we have to make. His instruction is to make the right choice, to choose the way of God. Deuteronomy forces us to put ourselves in the shoes of the people of Israel, standing on the banks of the Jordan. And their shoes fit us remarkably well. It reminds us that we too are on a journey with God, that every day we can choose whether we move forward or stay where we are. And if we move which way we go, do we go on the way of God or do we go on our own way? One way lies blessing, the power of life itself to expand and flourish in all sorts of ways. The other way lies rejection of blessing, literally separation from God. Moses said, this day I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now, choose life. Amen.